okay um i'll formally start the webinar now um i welcome all the participants and uh, uh, professor mohammed slim alawini um today we're here for a webinar on technological trends for beyond 5g networks um so before the webinar i'll very briefly introduce um, our distinguished speaker um uh, he was born in uh, tunisia and he got his phd from uh, um, California Institute of Technology in Electrical Engineering. Um, currently, he is a distinguished professor um, electrical and computer engineering um, in King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Um, professor Alawini is a fellow of IEEE and of the OSA. Um, uh, he's particularly interested in addressing the technical challenges associated with the uneven distribution, access to, and use of information and communication technologies. Um, focusing on the uh, flung and uh, rural populations of low uh, income countries. Uh, before we start on with the webinar, I'll briefly introduce you to ComSec's new flagship project um, under the guidance of our coordinator general, which is um, the ComSec technology and innovation portal. I'll just share my screen now. So this is our new flagship project in which we have uh, basically provided a digital platform um, for the OIC world to showcase their emerging and existing technologies. Um, it is a platform that caters for two individuals, one who are looking for um, various technologies in an uh, area of interest of their liking. Um, they can That can be for collaboration, that can be for um, uh, as investors, it's up to them. And the other um, individual that it caters to are those that want to exhibit their technologies to a wide platform, a dig digital platform that caters to 57 countries. Uh, we are inviting exhibition in the following areas. It can be information and communication technologies, natural biosciences, medical sciences, energy or environment. Um, it can be um, uh, the technologies can be in a prototype phase or a commercial phase. Currently, we have 43 um, registrations and 28 products on the portal, out of which six are prototype and um, the rest are commercial. I'll give you a quick um, demonstration of the portal. For those that are searching for products or technologies or services, um, they can simply do so um, by choosing their own um, priority, whether um, it's a specific area of interest they're interested in, whether it's a specific country they're interested in, or a phase of uh, technology, whether it's a prototype level or a commercial level. Um, from here, you can look into each um, technologies, um, link up with the creator and um, have your collaboration. The other is those signing up for the technologies. They can simply um, log in um, using uh, an email address and they get verified in 24 to 48 hours. So we invite you to visit this portal um, and register your services, your products. Um, the web address is technologyportal.comstech.org. It is also available on our website, comstech.org, where it can be redirected um, to the portal. With that, I'll now formally um, invite Coordinator General Comstech, His Excellency Professor Dr. Mapadik Bal Chaudhary, for the welcome address of today's webinar. Good morning to uh, our colleagues in uh, South America, West Africa, uh, and good evening to our colleagues in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, this is a, a wonderful occasion of having someone of the stature of Professor Dr. Muhammad Salim Alioni. Uh, who is a distinguished professor at uh, one of the most prestigious institutions in the more, in the OIC world. And uh, his credentials as been introduced by Haseeb is of a very high caliber. So we have someone of extremely high stature, someone who has contributed uh, immensely in the development of science and technology in the region uh, and has uh, a great insight and vision about how things will move. Haseeb has introduced this technology portal of uh, Comstack. But the fact is technologies are developed by individuals of high caliber. Uh, these are the results of hard work. These are the res results of futuristic vision of how the world will shape uh, in coming years. And of course, that requires high quality manpower. 
uh, one of the most important endeavors of Comstec, which is OIC's Standing Committee for Science and Technology, is to promote capacity of young people in the OIC world, 57 member states. And uh, what can be a better way of doing it than uh, introducing them and giving them exposure to a person of the caliber of Professor Dr. Muhammad Salim Alioni. I'm very fortunate and extremely delighted to have him on board. He certainly uh, is a very busy person and his appearance today for this dedicated lecture represent his commitment for a greater human good and represent his commitment for supporting young people. With this, I would like to invite dear brother, Professor Dr. Muhammad for his presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Akmel, for really these kind words. I really appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate uh, the invitation by Comstec. I, invitation, uh, I, I appreciate and thank the coordination of uh, Dr. Hasib and uh, his team. So uh, to me, it's a pleasure and an honor to be part of uh, uh, this forum and uh, to share some of our uh, recent work with the uh, Comstec uh, community. So let me share my screen. I hope you all see my screen in full screen mode, yes, right? Sir, it's visible. Uh, yes, sir. Excellent. Okay. So actually, uh, I made the title a little bit more focused, just to to kind of emphasize the trend. I would like to uh, to, to 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 emphasize as part of my talk. So of course, uh, the talk is, is in the general area of beyond five G, but uh, beyond five G is a very broad uh, word. Uh, there are a lot of things going on, and I would tell you a little bit about them, but I would like to focus on one particular aspect that is relevant uh, to many of our countries in the, uh, in the OIC. And uh, what I'm talking about here is how to basically kind of reach a digital inclusiveness, how to connect the remaining three plus or four billion people who are currently unconnected or underconnected worldwide, and how this can be viewed as really a challenge for beyond 5G, but actually also an opportunity. So, of course, uh, as you may know, 6G is coming. Uh, you, may, uh, you may ask, I mean, well, what do you mean by 6G is coming? What I mean is, uh, worldwide, uh, 5G is being kind of deployed now, especially in the advanced and developed countries. And uh, the way this industry works is every 10 years, there is a cycle. So basically, 6G is going to be coming in 2030. Uh, you know, eight years from now, roughly, right? But uh, of course, to deploy 6G, you need to prepare for 6G. And uh, the preparation starts now. That's usually how it works. As you deploy a generation of wireless communication system, you start planning for the next generation. So there has been already quite a bit of workshops, summits, special issues on kind of uh, speculative approach or speculative kind of view uh, about what 6G is going to be, should be, might be, etc. Uh, we had our share of that uh, uh, speculation, let's say, and we wrote a, a paper published uh, uh, about uh, two years ago in uh, basically uh, Nature Electronics, where we gave our vision for 6G. And uh, if I want to summarize it in, uh, in uh, few words, I would say 6G is about super connecting the connected, and by that, by super connect the connect, I mean that 6G should be going after uh, pushing the envelope and the performance of what we have done so far. So higher data rate, higher capacity of connection, lower latency, so that basically we can go to this uh, uh, virtual uh, uh, reality world, augmented reality world, uh, uh, e-health uh, uh, or, or like remote surgery in real time, all of this basically uh, require a better performance from our wireless network. And that's one aspect we'll keep doing. But that, that's super connecting the connected. But the other aspect that 6G should pursue, and that will be the focus of today's talk, is connecting the unconnected. Indeed, one has to kind of uh, be aware that about half of world population is still either not connected or underconnected. And the reasons are many. Um, here going to overlook 
the social reason due to the fact that you know some people have uh, uh, lack of digital skills they don't know how to use a laptop or or or, or even a smartphone uh, some there is sometimes an issue of a lack of relevant uh, uh, digital content like those like let's say language etc in particular countries so all of this you know create this digital divide but what i would like to focus on rather is more the technical slash economical reasons that uh, create this digital divide so when, when we talk about digital divide, uh, we talk also about uh, access to power because we have to remember that uh, to be able to run your telecom network, you need to, to use a power grid. So if uh, you are in this part of the world where the power grid is either uh, not there or is not reliable, obviously you cannot enjoy a reliable telecom network. So that's you know, a very obvious reason why we are having sometimes these bad statistics. But also uh, another important reason is uh, uh, the way uh, the kind of network are deployed uh, are, uh, or the way they are operated, they are using uh, the concept or the economic kind of uh, like, um, you know, concept of return on investment. So you, you kind, of, uh, uh, kind of invest quite a bit of money to set up your network in terms of research, in terms of getting spectrum, in terms of getting equipment and so on. And then eventually you get back your returns by deploying this kind of uh, uh, infrastructure uh, in highly dense areas. So it does not make much sense for a mobile network operator to lay uh, 100, if not 1,000 kilometers of optical fiber cable to reach uh, a sparsely populated remote area. Okay, that's not the way they would be able to recover back their money. So we need to find a solution to this problem. And by the way, when we talk about coin divide or digital divide, we are not just talking about, uh, you know, let's say uh, developing countries or uh, um, uh, rural area in developed country. We, we can be talking about uh, the heart of some of the biggest city in the world. Uh, I'm talking here about low income neighborhood, the flavelas, uh, the slums uh, that you can see uh, in some of the big cities where basically it becomes more an affordability problem. I mean, maybe there is a network that is covering that area, but it's, it's relatively expensive for the income of people living there. And essentially you end up having a digital divide even in the heart of some big cities. Uh, so affordability uh, means that you need to kind of lower the cost of the network at all levels, at the backhaul level, at the access level, and at the user end level, okay? Now, uh, in parallel to all this, you probably all heard about the so-called sustainable development goals. These are, uh, uh, I would say, very important uh, goals uh, that have been set by uh, the United Nations uh, and uh, or have been voted by the nation that are uh, part of the United Nations. And uh, they, are no, they are noble in the sense they're trying to reduce inequalities, fight hunger, provide quality education, and so on and so forth, as kind of displayed in the slide in front of you. And they are supposed to be achieved by 2030. And incidentally, 2030 is the year where we expect to start seeing uh, 6G being deployed. So with that in mind, we believe that actually, uh, contrary to the previous generation of wireless communication networks that have been essentially driven by, I would say, profit and financial kind of uh, needs uh, or objectives, uh, we hope that 6G will be driven, or at least partly driven, uh, by these United Nations SDGs, which means they'll be more uh, efficient. And not, I'm not talking about spectral efficiency, which where we did a good job, but rather uh, more energy efficient, uh, in the sense that uh, they'll be more green and uh, will lead to less CO2 emission. Uh, as you know, it's becoming also an important problem. We want them to be more uh, friendly towards the environment and towards our human health. And that's another topic that's, of course, of very much of interest. And uh, we are doing some research on that, but it's beyond the scope of today's talk. And there are ways of reducing the EMF radiation of these networks. But what I would like to focus on here is digital inclusion. We want to make sure that future network will include more people, will connect more people, will kind of fight this digital divide. Of course, because we rely more and more on our daily life on wireless connection these days, we want this uh, connection to be, uh, I would say, more secure, more private. And again, because of our uh, really strong reliance on this network, uh, we cannot afford outage anymore, like the way we don't afford the blackouts uh, when you talk about power grid. So we want this network to be resilient, robust, and dependable. Okay. 
So, and as you will see today, I'll be focusing more on digital inclusiveness or how to mitigate the digital divide, but also I will make that connection with resilience and how uh, if you invest in research and network that are uh, inclusive, uh, especially in rural area, actually you are solving indirectly a resilience problem. So in other words, those of you who are uh, kind of uh, research and wireless communication are very familiar with this kind of uh, web diagram, identifying the so-called uh, three famous user scenario for 5G, uh, the blue enhanced mobile broadband, the green ultra reliable and low latency communication, the red massive mass type communication. That's what 5G is about. Uh, 6G will be pretty much the same, but the KPI will be pushed further. If we will not be talking about one gigabit per second or 10 gigabit per second, we'll talk about your, your peak data rate of one terabit per second in order to have this augmented reality or virtual reality type of apps. Uh, running uh, in our phones. But on the top of that, what we would like to see, we would like to see basically uh, finally uh, reaching or achieving this uh, noble Gaia goal. And Gaia stands for global access to the internet for all. That's part of our objective as part of uh, beyond 5G and 6G type of uh, network deployment. And this is going to uh, serve the base of the pyramid. Uh, some of you are maybe familiar with this kind of uh, economical concept, where in, when you rank people based on their income, you realize that basically most of the people in the world are actually having a low income, and they form the base or the bottom of this pyramid. And uh, 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 these tend to be the people who are uh, unconnected or underconnected. And essentially, these people are, have been largely excluded from formal markets. Uh, and they represent actually because of their mass in terms of numbers, a huge market of creative and resilient consumer and producer. So if you connect them, uh, even at a very low cost uh, with a very affordable kind of connectivity kind of subscriptions, then basically you have access to a huge market. And that explains why I would say the best research being done these days or today in the area of connectivity uh, in rural areas, remote areas, and so on, is relatively done uh, uh, in the top university. I mean, there are, of course, few people interested in that, but really, a lot of the best research being done in the big uh, tech company. I'm talking here about the Facebook, you know, of course, now it's called Meta, uh, Connectivity Research Lab, Google, uh, they have a lot of initiatives, uh, uh, Amazon, uh, uh, um, Microsoft, all of them have very strong initiatives on connecting the unconnected, uh, in part because they kind of saturating on the urban kind of uh, market and they need to go beyond and they need to expand their base of users uh, and lower the cost so they can uh, basically kind of connect and then eventually subscribe to their kind of uh, apps and services. So uh, achieving this goal of full connectivity for the whole world will allow us to break this vicious cycle of this divide where you have areas with weak development and growth, and which basically, because of that, there is little investment. So if we invest in these areas, it's like essentially when you have a remote area and connected to the rest of a country, let's say, and connect via a train connection or via kind of a highway, automatically that area will start flourishing, will start having some commercial exchange with the rest of the country or and eventually the world. And that area, uh, basically quality of life and income will, will just kind of raise. Same way, if you connect an area digitally or uh, through an ICT infrastructure, you will have the opportunity to improve uh, the quality of education by having access to some of the best uh, remote education services, quality of health through remote health, access to banking services and financial transaction and access to a big market to sell your product and so on. So that's objective in one hand, but on the other hand, actually beyond just connecting the unconnected, once you uh, essentially uh, uh, have this infrastructure, that can motivate some people who are currently were living in these congested, sometimes polluted, uh, huge cities, just because they, they need to have access to the benefit and good service typically that are concentrated in big cities. But some people may choose to live in uh, kind of suburbs or in, uh, let's say, uh, uh, hamlets or villages, as long as these villages are connected uh, and well connected, uh, because they will be able to work remotely, as we have seen during COVID-19. Many of us have worked properly uh, from anywhere they are, as long as their job uh, is of that kind of nature that can uh, uh, allow remote work. So what I'm saying, 
we can move out of this somehow narrow concept of a smart city to something broader that we can call uh, a smart living. It includes smart villages, smart rural areas, smart hamlets, and this can trigger in a way a counter urbanization process, which is good because our world is suffering already for this kind of exponential growth of mega cities. Having better connectivity worldwide will help maybe uh, reverse that trend. Finally, before we start uh, talking about some technical kind of uh, uh, research around these themes, I have been focusing so far mainly on connecting uh, people. But the matter and the fact is once you create this infrastructure, once you create this umbrella that can connect the world, you are not going to connect only people. You'll be able to connect all kinds of sensor and actuators and benefit from this concept of so-called Internet of X things. Internet of underwater things, Internet of space things, Internet of underground things, not only the Internet that is being used in smart cities or smart factories. You can put sensor anywhere on top of mountains, in farms, so that you have other kind of application, a smart agriculture type of application, or basically environment monitoring and climate uh, uh, monitoring uh, uh, kind of uh, studies. So, uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, this can create a fully connected world that can be better monitored and better studied and, 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 and better exploited in terms of resource and terms of agriculture. So uh, let me now uh, uh, start talking about some of the research uh, being done at KAUST uh, in this general area of connected and unconnected. One of the first parts we started with is to characterize digital inequality, to basically try to understand where do we have uh, basically pockets of uh, digital divide. And uh, of course, uh, there are some measures out there, but they are kind of done at the country level. Uh, this is known as the GCMA Mobile Connectivity Index or the Inclusive Internet Index uh, that are basically providing country-wise statistics. And uh, these cannot reflect the fine-grained uh, kind of resolution sometimes we'd like to see in a particular city or in a particular province. Uh, so we were after trying to get this kind of uh, accurate measure to quantify the connection service and balance uh, in some particular area within any country of choice. And uh, we came up with this kind of uh, approach where we proposed a, a new index and uh, we kind of validated and uh, we kind of start using it actually to optimize the deployment of our networks. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about our uh, uh, Index, it's an index that is function of three parameters. So you, you take an, any particular area, you try to check uh, the population in that area, the number of base station in that area, and the number of users can connect to base station in that area. And with that, you propose this index, which is kind of a combination of a logistic and predict function, which are widely used in data science and economics. Uh, and they are supposed, uh, or this parameter, this index is supposed to reflect basically the level of uh, imbalance uh, in a particular area, given a certain number of people and certain number of base stations, a certain number of people that can connect to base station in that area. And then you take uh, any country of your choice, here's just, we take Uganda, and you divide in a, in a, in a grid of, let's say, a few kilometers by few kilometers. And you need to know in that particular area, how many base stations do you have and how many people live in that area? and check if you, 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 things go together, they match, if you have enough base station to cover that density of people. Now, it happens that there are two very useful uh, databases in this context. One is called the Open Cell ID database, which gives you in real time uh, where base stations are being kind of uh, deployed worldwide. Uh, and then uh, there is another interesting uh, kind of database that has been developed uh, over the last few years by Facebook. It's called the Facebook Connectivity lab high resolution population density map and it gives you basically the number of people that live in squares 20 meters by 20 meters it's the this this map has been done based on data coming from uh, uh, satellite imagery data coming from government from united nations some machine learning tools have been used to fuse all this data and essentially you get an idea where there's strong concentration of people and less concentration of people on a 20 meter by 20 meter type of resolution so Using these two data, using our kind of index, we're able to kind of check how good uh, is the level of imbalance. Just, this is to show you how our imbalance index works. Obviously, if you increase, like the row is the number of uh, uh, users can connect to a particular base station. If it's 100, you get that kind of uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, imbalance. If you make it 200, you see you have more blue, less yellow, which means uh, uh, you, you are connecting more people, so you have less imbalance, which is good, okay? So just to make a long story short, uh, we run our algorithm and uh, we kind of check how many can, uh, how some country perform. So you see here, for example, a country like Uganda, and what you notice, of course, around some big cities, you have some good connectivity, but then when you get dive into kind of uh, deep rural Uganda, obviously you start seeing a lot of red, a lot of orange, which means that you start seeing a strong imbalance between the available infrastructure and the people, which means you are suffering from a digital divide. Same done for Brazil and same kind of trends you see. Uh, you see basically some pockets uh, of uh, good connectivity, but then uh, some also large zones, relatively bad connectivity in red, yellow, and uh, orange. Even in the US, uh, you know, of course, a super developed country, uh, uh, situation overall is good, but you do have also, again, pockets of uh, uh, red and orange, which kind of reflect the fact that we do suffer in some of these areas from deep uh, uh, connectivity divide. Uh, we are talking here about uh, the deep rural America where it's well known that uh, there are uh, some uh, uh, connectivity or digital divide problems. And as you may have heard uh, recently, uh, President Biden and the US administration are putting a lot of money in infrastructure, in part actually also to, to solve the internet problem in these rural areas. So uh, worldwide, that's what you get, what you see. Uh, of course, like Kent, like in Europe uh, or Japan, Korea, they tend to have very good connectivity. But then uh, as you go to Africa and uh, uh, some of the Southeast Asia, uh, you do have more orange, uh, yellow and red, which is an indication of basically uh, not perfect connectivity. Now, just to kind of uh, wrap up this, we did kind of, uh, kind of let's say, a validation of our index. Uh, with respect to GCMA mobile index at the country level, and we see a very high correlation, which is what we propose, uh, you know, compare very well with what the GCMA mobile index basically uh, is predicting. Uh, but uh, we have the advantage of being able to go and do res uh, fine grain resolution at the level of province and, and, and areas. If you want to know more about this project, you can go to this website. By the way, I, I can make my slides available to, to Hasib and he can share it with the whole audience. And uh, as you see here in this website, uh, if you can, if you go there, we have a kind of a, kind of a, an interface that will allow you to play a little bit with any country of your choice and check which are the countries that are suffering from more uh, uh, community divide than others. Uh, so that's uh, uh, a paper that has been uh, accepted and uh, that's also available on archive. And the companion website is giving you the opportunity to run remotely all the algorithms that we developed. Now, what I talked about so far is just the problem, diagnosis. We do have a problem that we're trying to address, but now how can we address this problem? How can we start connecting the unconnected? One way to explain this, this problem is by looking at this, at this very simple diagram, uh, where basically we are looking at the quality of experience in terms of data rate, latency, and so on, in terms of cost per user in remote low population density areas. So obviously in this kind of corner, uh, you, you, you have a low cost, but you have a low quality of experience if you talk about internet. Classical geo satellites are good for TV broadcasting. They are not good for internet. They are very expensive if you want to use them for internet. Now, if you go on this particular corners, then obviously you can have the speed, you can have the quality of experience, but it's very expensive because as I mentioned, it doesn't make much sense to go and start digging fibers or putting wireless point-to-point -point leaks over hundreds and thousands of kilometers to reach sparse populated areas. So this option is not good. What we are after is this sweet spot here, this so-called global connectivity holy grail, where we are able to provide a high quality of experience, but at a low cost per user in remote low population density areas. In order to achieve this uh, very interesting uh, prophetic, in a way, uh, vision that uh, uh, Tesla had 20 years ago, where he was kind of, uh, kind of thinking in a 5G and 6G terms way ahead of his time. So the key words here is, we would like to use integrated space, air, ground networks. By that, we are going to keep using the classical ground infrastructure that you all know for cellular, uh, cellular communication, but we'll augment that 
by using all kind of drones uh, at low altitude or drones at high altitude, we call them high altitude platform or high altitude pseudo station like balloons or, or huge drones like that that operate stratosphere are 20 kilometer altitude. And we'll be using also satellite, all in integrated fashion. So we are not going to see any more this kind of uh, disjoint kind of network that we have been operating now. These networks are going to coexist, are going to collaborate together in order to provide service to the ground user. The ground user will use anywhere he goes the same phone. What made previous system fail because they had different phones for different environments. You know, if you want to go to rural area, you want a satellite, you need to have a satellite phone. If you are an urban environment, you use like a 3G or 4G phone. The idea now, we are not going to differentiate between all kinds of phones. The phones are going to be just the standard 4G, eventually 5G, and on the long term, 6G phones. They will be talking to the close by ground station, the close by drone, but then the rest of the network will take care of the backhauling in and, an and, and integrated fashion without having to worry about who's talking uh, to what uh, from at least a user perspective. So let's talk about the backhaul. The backhaul is how to kind of reach this remote area uh, in a low cost fashion. The way to go is to use satellite communication. And there are many satellite communication solutions. We have been active on multiple fronts. One front where we have been active is the so-called hybrid, very high throughput satellite communication with site diversity. By very high throughput, we are talking about satellite that can handle up to one terabit per second. They are hybrid because on one side, they will have these beams that are programmable, adjustable, that can move, they can go where traffic is needed. But then they are backhauled by basically a feeder link. Currently, high throughput satellites are using KA band. By the 2030, is expected the KA band is going to become very competitive. Uh, there will be competition between the ground infrastructure and the satellite infrastructure to compete for the KA band from a spectrum perspective. But also, the KA band can start being used for the user link, which is which is now using KU band. And as such, what is being proposed is to do this feeder link in the optical domain using free space optic. In other words, laser links. Is like a fiber optic in the air. So of having a fiber optic connecting the gateway here to satellite, we have a free space laser link connecting this optical gateway to satellite. This can carry the terabit per second we'd like to, 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 to feed back to the ground from the satellite. But of course, this comes with challenges. One of the big challenges that we are looking at is alignment. How we can make sure that satellite is always perfectly aligned to the optical gateway station. The other problem we have to take care of is weather condition, you need to cross the atmosphere and you may be blocked by fog, by cloud. And that's why you need side diversity, which means you need to have a network of optical gateway station in the, net, in the ground. So basically if one optical gateway station is blocked, you are able to recover your signal from another nearby optical gateway station. For example, in Europe, studies have shown that you need roughly nine optical gateway stations strategically placed in nine locations in Europe in order to make sure based on historical data and studies on clouds and, and atmospheric condition to make sure that essentially you have pretty much always availability without outage uh, during the whole year. Another trend uh, within the satellite communication industry, if you want to lower uh, the latency and to a certain extent uh, the cost, because uh, essentially now the manufacturing cost of small satellite went down, there is this ability to mass produce satellites. And probably you have heard that uh, all of these uh, big, uh, I would say, initiatives that are being done uh, worldwide, uh, trying to uh, deploy this mega constellation. Uh, they, these are constellations operating on the low Earth orbit, uh, uh, anywhere, you know, depends how you define, you know, like 160, but typically we are talking, uh, when you talk about OneWeb, Starlink, this is SpaceX project, Lightspeed, uh, which is like a Teresat project, Kuiper, which is an Amazon project, Orchestra, which is Imarsat project. So there are many projects out there. Some of them already starting deploying the satellite. So it's expected within a few years, we are able to see this mega constellation covering the, the earth and providing internet worldwide, okay? Uh, so uh, this is really a race and it's a very nice development and we start seeing the fruit very soon. Uh, we have done some studies and uh, some of our studies have been focusing on trying to uh, understand the let's say density and the altitude of this mega constellation in order to secure a good coverage. And 
obviously we show that the, the more satellite you have, the better it is. And that's it we say in the, in the graph here in terms of coverage uh, increasing as N1, which is the number of satellite uh, in the constellation increase. Uh, and uh, of course, we show that the, the lower you are, the also the better it is from a, uh, from a coverage perspective. So uh, this is a study that we have done and that's part of the paper that decided in the earlier slide. Now, what you need also is you need to have good access. And uh, when you talk about access in a rural environment, it's completely uh, the opposite paradigm the way we do it in urban environment. In urban environment, you tend to densify, you tend to go to these small cells, and in order to kind of capture as many uh, users as possible in the small uh, areas. When you go to rural area where uh, population density is very low and people are very sparsely kind of uh, uh, spread in a in large region, what you need to go is for macro cells, super macro cells, okay? And for, for that reason, one solution is to, to kind of reuse TV towers that tend to be on the top of hills or mountains, uh, use like the low power spectrum to have good, basically, propagation characteristics and kind of uh, have a, uh, kind of tens of kilometer of coverage. Uh, and that, with that, you are going, going to capture uh, the, 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 the traffic needs of these users are scattered within this uh, uh, cell of, uh, of tens of kilometers of radius, as I mentioned. Now, if you don't have a TV tower or don't have like hills uh, surrounding your area, you can create artificially a super tower by basically uh, putting a base station attached to one of these tethered balloon or airship or aerostat. These are basically a flying device that are using the buoyancy principle where basically you fill them with helium, you know, a gas that is lighter than air, so they can stay aloft. And basically they create the super tower with a, let's say a radius of coverage of 40 to 50 kilometers around it. So again, you are creating this kind of huge coverage area to be able to pick signals from users scattered in that particular region. Now, uh, if you want to go higher uh, in order to have a bigger footprint, uh, you can go for hubs high altitude platform station or high altitude solar satellite. Uh, these are operating uh, in the stratosphere at 20 kilometer altitude, just for calibration purpose. The airplane we pick, typically they fly at 10 kilometer altitude. And uh, basically the idea of these, uh, uh, let's say, hubs is that uh, they, uh, they come in from different form. They can come from drones, airships, balloons, and uh, the budget link is in a way still very favorable in the sense that we can still use them as aerial base station and we can st still use a standard phone to make a connection with the hubs. Okay, so you don't need to have a dish or a, or a small a small dish in your home to connect to a hubs. To connect to a hubs, you can still connect with your phone and the hubs can be back hold, uh, you know, through a feeder link to the ground. So that's the main advantage of the hubs. You cannot connect uh, with the, today's technology, back to a satellite, even Leo satellite, because it's at much higher altitude, but it, you can connect to hubs. So that's kind of the way I see the hubs uh, evolving. I call that the very high throughput hubs paradigm. So hubs can be at the border between the city and the rural areas, or a kind of you know, kind of a suburban area, and it can have an optical feeder link to 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 get a high speed. Uh, a kind of uh, back hole. And then you can have, again, these kind of uh, beams. And the beam can be used to do some offloading in urban environment where you need some help, but can be used also to connect the unconnected within the uh, rural and villages surrounding urban environment, especially that the hubs have, uh, you know, a radius of coverage that can be of 100 plus kilometers. So you can have really a wide coverage area uh, uh, with the same kind of uh, infrastructure. Another interesting connection uh, I'm trying to make here is uh, as humans, we have used uh, all kinds of transportation system. We use the underground for subways. We use the ground for cars, trucks, uh, the sea for boats. We have used the air for airplanes at 10 km altitude. But there is this near ground space that has been lightly used by helicopter that is underused. And there are a lot of these proposals to start using it for flying taxis, uh, drones that would be used to move uh, kind of merchandise. So these kind of basically autonomous flying vehicles to move goods and people are going to be part of our reality in the coming few years. These flying autonomous vehicles will need the support of telecom network for two purposes. Number one, to make sure that they can do their navigation in a safe way, they're autonomous, they need to have all kinds of, uh, kind of information, so they need to communicate to the rest uh, of, of, of the network, and this should be done 
through a, 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 a wireless network that can be coming from a satellite or, or a HAPS or like a tether balloon, because uh, uh, the tether balloon can get a slightly higher altitude. And also, they can be, uh, they need to be connected because uh, if you're a flying taxi, there'll be some passenger that would like obviously to probably uh, browse the internet or do their uh, email while uh, going through their trip. So uh, that's another interesting connection between emerging uh, space and aerial network and uh, all these uh, flying vehicles that would need this kind of network also. So let me here show you uh, as an example how we can use drones to help connect the unconnected. So let's assume it's kind of stochastic geometry based analysis. I'm not going to the in detail, but I will explain the concept. We have here a downtown uh, or like an air, like an urban environment, uh, very well connected with a lot of base station. As you move away from this kind of urban environment, basically the number of or density of base station decreases. Uh, we assume an expansion decrease in, in the density of base station. And as such, you may end up having user here not being able to connect to this station because they are far away. So you need to help them by injecting some drones that can position themselves in an optimal location in real time to serve the user in need of communications. And what we showed is, is that obviously that's the coverage probability as functional distance from the town center. If you don't use any drone, that's what you see in terms of coverage. The coverage will decrease drastically as you move away from the, uh, the town center because you're not helping the users that are kind of uh, spread uh, in a sparse way uh, far from, down, from the center. But as soon as you start injecting some, I would say, uh, 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 drones, then obviously you, you, you recover coverage probability and you try to, you, you start, you can even outperform the coverage probability, you can get an urban environment because you can place optimally drones to, to help the few pocket where you need to have connectivity in rural areas. So that's, uh, a way to show how we can mitigate uh, the digital divide by uh, relying on some drones. Uh, another project we did with uh, one student recently, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the issues that we have to deal with when you talk about uh, uh, remote areas is like sometimes the lack of uh, the power grid or the, or the power grid may not be reliable. So as telecom operator, you may need to come with your own power grid and, and kind of integrate with your uh, a telecom network. So you probably have, uh, I mean, maybe some of you have seen CNN a few years ago, this interesting report about solar powered kiosk that are charging phones in, in Rwanda, uh, because people also can need to charge their phones. There are also these kind of one five base station that have solar panels, wind turbine, in order to kind of uh, uh, power the uh, telecom network uh, in this remote uh, area. So we kind of uh, use the same concept here uh, and uh, went a little bit further. Uh, one of my students noticed that uh, uh, basically we tend to place uh, wind turbine in, 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 in remote areas, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in rural areas. And uh, his idea was to, uh, that's Mauri Matrashia, uh, is to kind of connect uh, or to attach base station to this wind turbine. The wind turbine tend to operate from a relatively high uh, height, so they can have good line of sight. Uh, you can kind of backhaul them by putting a satellite uh, VSAT uh, dish uh, near this uh, uh, wind turbine, or because the wind turbine uh, anyway is a source of uh, power, uh, and we are trying to transform it to, to become a source not only of power, but also of information. Uh, but because of the fact that it's a source of power, uh, yeah, you know, in the neighborhood probably if you see some uh, power lines, and you can use this uh, robot proposed by Facebook, it's called Bombix, that is basically there to wrap optical fiber onto power lines. And with that, you can backhaul your, uh, your, uh, your uh, wind turbine to which you can attach uh, some base station. And uh, the next question is, where should we place this kind of uh, uh, wind turbine, uh, like ba base station augmented, let's say, wind turbine? So obviously you need to place them where, are, where we have wind turbine. We have wind turbine, we have favorable wind statistics. We did some studies actually in France, in Argentina, even actually in Ethiopia, as part of the review process of the paper that has recently been accepted and that's going to appear in the December 2021 issue of a uh, special issue on digital divide by the communication magazine. So basically, if you zoom, for example, in France, in this particular region in Brittany, then what you notice is uh, and there is already a telecom infrastructure, but of course, because there are some favorable wind statistics, there are a lot of wind turbines. So if you pick a few wind turbines and uh, augment them by an 
or add to the base station, uh, then basically, uh, obviously, you can improve the performance. So this is kind of the performance the data rate. Uh, the more dark it is, the lower is data rate. So here, the, the data rate, uh, when there is no uh, wind turbine uh, uh, base stations, but then when you start attaching base station to wind turbine, you improve uh, uh, to a certain extent your data rate. And now, actually, if you start uh, strate strategically adding some new wind turbine in location where you have favorable dense population because you can place your wind turbine where you have a little bit more people, even in these kind of sparse populated areas, then you can really start doing very good in terms of uh, increasing your data rates. Uh, we do the same thing in Argentina with similar results where we show that uh, by adding some wind turbines, uh, we uh, so adding some basic wind turbine, you can go uh, from this kind of setup on the left to this kind of result on the right, where you have uh, much better uh, connectivity or speed of connection. Now, let me wrap up my talk by, uh, as I mentioned earlier, establishing this connection between connect and connect and resilience. So obviously, uh, you know, we tend to be connected if you are living in this kind of well-connected urban environment, but this can be lost anytime. If your city is subject of a natural disaster or man-made terrorist attack, then obviously your infrastructure can be broken and uh, you need some time to kind of fix it. And uh, you'll be living a few days where basically you will be unconnected and uh, you need uh, to make your network resilient and uh, uh, operational. You need to be able to deploy on the spot uh, a network on demand that can help you uh, connect just after the disaster. If you are uh, part of this uh, big concert or soccer game where really you need like an extra capacity because everyone's using the phone at the same time, uh, then you need to help the ground infrastructure by providing some extra support, maybe from the air through drones, to basically provide momentary uh, networking on demand to help this kind of uh, extra capacity that is needed. If you are sending uh, scientists in the middle of the desert or North Pole and you want them still to communicate with you in real time uh, in an area that's obviously not connected, then you need to have this uh, pop-up network or networking and demand capability available. And of course, military people tend always to use network in any other area, so that they, they, they are very well kind of familiar with this kind of problems. So when you, whenever you talk about pop-up network or uh, network on demand uh, or network in the box, essentially what you are after is a backhole solution through a satellite or microwave link, an access solution and access to spectrum, uh, solving the power problem, uh, through typically renewable uh, energy, like solar panel, wind turbine. And then all of this has to be deployed in a record amount of time, especially in post-disaster operation, because the faster you establish your network, the faster you can start helping people and uh, the better it is. So we have been looking at this concept of network in a box, where basically you have an integrated backhaul access solution within a backpack. And this backpack can be backhauled to um, you know, a variety of uh, kind of solution, backhaul, Wi-Fi, cable, whatever it is. Uh, and then it can act as a Wi-Fi access point or a 5G access point. But basically, it's something you can carry on, on your backpack or in a small boat. Uh, as an example here, we looked at this optimization problem. So you have a boat that's trying to go from this location to this location while passing by two critical points here, let's say, to wash some dolphins and to do some, uh, let's say, uh, snorkeling or scuba diving. Uh, so obviously we look at different options to keep uh, this small boat connected. So uh, what we realize that the optimal solution, if you have a network in the box in this boat, is to connect to different uh, basically services depending where you are. So you can start with the 3G connection from this coastline, and then you move uh, towards basically a connection to this yacht, let's say here that has a very good satellite connection, and you have an agreement with that yacht, and you can start connecting to that yacht, and then you connect to uh, to this uh, island and uh, network, etc. So we compared our optimal solution in red to other solutions where we use a signal system, either cellular network or satellite, etc. Et and it showed our optimized solution that is basically using different network capabilities depending where you are. Uh, in, when you optimize that, obviously this can lead to an increase in average data rate compared to the unoptimized solution. So having a network in the box that is able to talk to different kind of standards, different kind of networks, uh, will allow you to basically rip off most of the benefit from the neighboring networks and operate with the maximum data rate. One last set of slides to wrap up my talk. Uh, 
here's an example how drones can help in post-disaster uh, kind of uh, setup. So you have a disaster occurred uh, in this particular area. So this infrastructure or this base stage that used to be red now are gray, and they are broken, they don't operate, they are not working. So to replace them, we send some drones, okay, to help basically connect the first respondent and people who are there. So what we showed here, uh, and the question we ask ourselves, how many drones should we send at what altitude? And the two lessons we learned from our study is there is an optimal number of drones you send. If you send too many drones, you can lose in coverage because they start interfering with each other. And then the other lesson we learned if your disaster is, is huge, is in the order of uh, tens of hundreds of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers, it does make sense to send multiple drones at low altitude. It better makes better sense to use a single high altitude platform or, or a few high altitude platform to have a full coverage of that huge disaster area. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would be happy to take some questions. And again, uh, as telecom engineers, we are here to fulfill one of these interesting uh, other kind of uh, perspective made uh, by uh, Tesla, uh, you know, a century ago, where again, as I mentioned earlier, he was already thinking in a 5G and 6G term in a way that basically we are going to fully connect the world. Thanks for attention, and I'll be happy to take some questions. Um, thank you so much, Professor. Um, to all the participants, whoever has questions, just write them down in the chat, please. So let's just give it a couple of minutes. Um, okay, there are some questions from Dr. Sadiq Khan from University of Karachi. He mm -hmm. says, how we, how we handle the processing power issue in order to design low power devices? Yeah, this is an important aspect. It's uh, something I didn't talk about today. But energy efficiency, power efficiency is, is an important aspect in future network. We need to be more green. We need to do that at all levels. We need to do that at the device level. We do that at the physical layer level by adapting the, um, you know, the physical link characteristic to, to the channel. Uh, as you may be aware of, uh, there has been quite a bit of research these days on intelligent reflecting surfaces, which are trying to act as reflectors uh, intelligent reflector to minimize the amount of power coming out of our devices while uh, covering the same, if not more, areas. And at the network level, architectural level. So uh, being more green, being more energy efficient is an objective. And there are multiple front uh, to make this happen in the future. Dr. Sadiq also has another question. What are the current attacks mitigation techniques used in 6G networks? What, what do you mean by attacks? Um, it says attack mitigation techniques. I mean, if he's talking from a from a security perspective, cybersecurity, I'm not an expert in, in, in security. If you're going to attack a network and kind of make it, um, you know, uh, you know, like uh, make it collapse or, or steal information. Uh, I, 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 again, I'm not an expert at all. But what I can say is an important topic, of course. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of activity today uh, making sure that future network have to be super secure, preserve our privacy, uh, because we are relying so much on them uh, today already and even more in the future. Um, there is a question. Uh, may you please highlight any adverse reactions of 5G or 6G to the human body and other challenges to which security or privacy? I mean, yeah, security and private, as I said, you know, there is a lot of efforts. Are we going to be able to achieve that? Full security, full privacy, you know, it's kind of a, a continuous race, a continuous competition between hackers and, and people who are trying to use internet. But hopefully people will try to become, you know, try to protect more and more, but that's an ongoing kind of effort. Now, yes, the health issues, uh, people always are aware, afraid of that. We have been doing some work on this issue. So EMF radiation, of course, are important, need to be monitored. There are some standards. They are typically super uh, conservative. You want to be basically operating at the, uh, with very kind of low power uh, with respect to, to this threshold to make sure that you are way below 
uh, the threshold, uh, let's say, set to, um, to, 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 to communicate on a safe regime. Nonetheless, I believe uh, we should do more. Uh, so one of the work uh, research kind of line that we are doing in my group is we are developing or we're working on what we call EMF aware wireless networking, which means wireless network that can communicate uh, as we want them to communicate with the right kind of quality of service from the data rate and, and so on. However, uh, we want them to, uh, to uh, radiate less. So they can basically communicate with the right quality, but with less EMF radiation. And we are using all kinds of uh, ideas, using drones or using intelligent services, decoupling, uplink, and downlink. So they, we have a series of paper on that, and I'll be happy to share them with you if you're interested. Um, so a question from Mr. Kashif is also similar to the one you answered. One of the goals of 6C discussed in the talk is to have it health friendly. Were there any health issues associated with 5G that has triggered this goal? No, I, I would say 5G is still safe based on uh, the fact that we are operating really below the thresholds. Uh, and, and safety is here defined from a thermal perspective. So basically, uh, we, we, you know, heating, like the, the amount of, uh, of energy we are getting basically from, uh, uh, from EMF radiation is, is, not burn, is not burning our skin or something like that, okay? Because we are way below the thresholds uh, that will, will lead to that kind of effects. Nonetheless, I think, uh, yes, when 5G was deployed, like, uh, or started being deployed last year, maybe communication was not ready, uh, maybe people didn't explain very well, and there was a lot of attacks in the media on 5G uh, killing birds and being uh, harmful to, to our health. But, uh, and this led to uh, arson attacks in, in many countries. But the matter and the fact is that basically 5G is still operating and the very strict, uh, um, I would say, um, uh, uh, regulations and uh, all what uh, results have been published so far are showing that uh, 5G is, is really very safe. But uh, as we move to higher frequencies, as we kind of dig really, really more into this, uh, it is good to kind of uh, um, anyway reduce EMF radiation because usually that comes also with an energy efficiency gain. And uh, check actually from a biology or medical science perspective if indeed there are other maybe effect, other biological effects beyond just the thermal effect or heating effect that we have been focused on uh, to design our uh, wireless networks. Um, there is a question from Ms. Seher. At university level, what else we can do to contribute to 6G and 5G? For example, what sort of technical projects and technical information to represent and proceed to 6G? I mean, I, what I mentioned today is one aspect like connect the unconnected, working on drone-based systems, the hubs-based systems uh, uh, is one approach, working on intelligent reflecting surfaces, on, uh, on, on terahertz communication, uh, where basically you are, want to go for, for super high speed uh, connectivity and uh, we are running out of spectrum, so we need to go to higher bands. There are a lot of research direction on uh, beyond 5G and 6G. And uh, the best way is to kind of, uh, go to one of the recent uh, conferences proceedings and check basically what are the trends and quickly you, you identify the key four or five trends that uh, maybe you can pick one of them to work on. I think these are all the questions we have now. Um, if the participants have any more questions, they can simply email them to me and I will forward them to Professor Mohammed to answer. Thank you very much. I I think that's all. So I would like to once again thanks, thank you, Professor Mohammed, for taking out your time and giving such a brilliant lecture today. Um, and to the participants that are present, we have had roughly 100 participants for this webinar um, from various countries. So this um, webinar would also be uploaded on our YouTube channel for people to revisit and other people to um, have a look. Also, uh, once you share your presentation with me, I will forward that to the participants as well for their use. Sure. Um, thank you so much, sir. And thank you. Hopefully we'll have more lectures from you in the future. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank and let's keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.